the wealthy actually play in this? The, should they pay more taxes? That's not a dialogue that we ever have. Those are the questions that are actually raised. Should we cut war spending? Nobody ever talks about this. But when you actually look about the effect of those things on the budget, you see that they're a huge chunk. But those are sort of the, the bipartisan agreements that we don't get in our traditional political sphere here. So. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we have two guests. We have Nicholas Caleb and Mike Lozier. 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 Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nick is a professor of American government at Concordia University here in Portland, and Mike is media spokesperson for Portland Action Lab. So welcome mm -hmm. to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Great, yeah. So we want to talk about uh, austerity. What is it? How has it played out in Europe? How is it playing out in the United States, even though we don't know it's playing out? Uh, and then we want to talk about N3. All right, so right. Let, let's start with a discussion about, well, let's just define what austerity is, because most Americans, uh, as we were just saying, uh, have, haven't even heard the term, even though in Europe it's uh, very well known. Uh, so let's define what the term is. You want to start, Mike? Yeah, so um, austerity is an economic program of policies that uh, seeks to um, balance what's is told as a budget deficits with uh, cuts to social programs like uh, Social Security, Medicare, um, education. And, um, and what this does is that this provides a convenience uh, story or out for you know, the, uh, the, the wealthy elite of this country to not pay their fair share into public budgets and uh, an excuse to kind of cannibalize um, you know, uh, public um, uh, assets as well. Okay. All right. Anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, I think it's really important to note that when austerity is talked about, um, they usually don't use the word austerity, you talk about budget cuts or, or fiscal deficits or something like that, or national debt becomes all of a sudden really very, very important when this dialogue comes up. But it never, the thing that hasn't been questioned in this country in a long time is the role that the wealthy actually play in this. The, should they pay more taxes? That's not a dialogue that we ever have. Those are the questions that are actually raised. Should we cut war spending? Nobody ever talks about this. But when you actually look about the effect of those things on the budget, you see that they're a huge chunk. But those are sort of the, the bipartisan agreements that we don't get in our traditional political sphere here. So we, we don't go there. Um, so what we're trying to do is sort of put those things back on the map. So like, well, you know, people are feeling it, but as a country, the wealth is there. We're not actually in this huge crisis. People say we are. We just don't take money from the places where it actually exists. Yeah, and the interesting about this, too, is that um, this is kind of described as a economic recovery, you know, uh, measure. And, uh, and the, the reason why this is interesting is because, you know, this is framed in response to the 2008 recession. And so, you know, we know trillions of dollars went to the, you know, financial sector to bail them out, and now we have, you know, uh, budgets being proposed to cut trillions of dollars from our public budget. Um, but at the same time, too, though, uh, this, you know, aus these austerity policies have been something that's been started like 40 years ago, um, you know, mostly in the Reagan administration uh, as well, where, uh, you know, the, the wealthiest 1% and corporations have received, you know, uh, significant tax breaks. Um, you know, um, uh, loopholes uh, as well that they can uh, benefit from, which has starved our budgets, you know, in the process and has created this, um, this story, you know, along these decades of a need to, you know, this, this imperative to balance, like, you know, deficits and stuff and that, you know, it's financially prudent to, um, you know, make cuts like this, so. Okay. Yeah. Can, can, can you talk about, uh, here in the United States, what kind of t cuts we're talking about and, and how they affect individual people? Sure. So um, some of the cuts that um, are happening right now, I think the post office is a really nice example, um, nice public, well, pseudo-public-private group, but it's, its budget is always under attack. And sometimes this can sort of be even an accounting trick, right? The post office has to account for its its pensions and its retirement fund 75 years in the future so it's sort of like artificially bankrupted and then they have lower uh, services medicare is always under attack you hear it talked about a lot in the presidential debates going on social security has been attacked a few times in the past and people have been able to withstand that but so at the national level those are the sort of things um, unemployment benefits um, having just an unemployment check to sort of get by um, in the 90s, it was the attack on welfare, 
So those are some of the things that we're most familiar with. And then there's stuff locally as well mm -hmm. that right. we talk about. And, and so these, these attacks were not just Republicans attacking. Well, these are Democrats, because you mentioned the 90s and the welfare mm -hmm. thing. That whole reform was a, a Clinton era uh, right. attack. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and you know, not only cuts too are part of this package as well, but it's also kind of like the selling off of public resources as well. Like we see, you know, uh, s state lands being sold off at you know way below market values as a way to kind of, um, you know, make up for you know deficit shortfalls. And uh, so, and, and and the you know the wealthy elite kind of get this advantage where they can kind of you know. You know, having access, you know, to these public resources, if they can buy cheap, they can announce these, you know, projects which create jobs. Is this like, you know, really important imperative that we have to act on? Like, you know, such as the coal exports that we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest, or um, or even Nestle, uh, you know, water privatization in the Gorge and mm -hmm. stuff is another example. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can Can you give me an example of how these have affected, you know, perhaps even you? Or, or people that you know, you know, some concrete examples? There's a couple different ways to look at it. Um, I'm an educator, I work for a private university, but I am in contact with a lot of um, public educators. And I think that's where, for me, the, the most obvious, like here's austerity um, in the process because their budgets are consistently cut and after school programs are cut. And um, there's just an article recently that more hours are gonna have to get cut in the school year. So that's the really obvious one but even you know we know our bridges are in disrepair in the city we have we're a bridge town and they're all falling apart but we don't have the money to do it where at the same time you know some uh, group like the Portland Development Commission has this sort of like never-ending flow of property taxes that it can spend to, to use development so there's there's money there it's just a prioritization of, of public resources um, but it's for me it's actually like a larger sort of cultural narrative where this this business logic of everything needing to be efficient in a very, very narrow sense sort of spreads throughout every sector of society. So I even see it at my university quite often, sort of that same logic sort of bleeding in. And it's it maybe not all that obvious, but once you sort of pick up on the narrative, you go, oh, okay, I see where this is coming from. Yeah. I recently attended a screening of some uh, videos that were made by some uh, activist groups here in Portland. One was made by Opal, which I forget what Opal stands for, but, uh, and it had to do, it was a story of a woman um, who works uh, in, uh, I, I think in the hotel industry, you know, making the beds, cleaning the rooms, and the effects that the recent cutbacks in service at TriMet had. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a dramatic, in fact, we're gonna have her here on the show probably, oh, and, and Hector from Opal here on the show in, in a few weeks to, to talk about that. But that was, in my mind, that was, it was such a dramatic um, case where the poorest among us get hurt the most by these kinds of cuts. Right. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, the response to these cuts in the United States has been very muted, uh, and I think in part that's because at the national level we don't really have advocates for outside of the Democrats and the Republicans. We don't have advocates for the public sector um, and and for the commons. Uh, but the response in Europe has been quite different. Can you talk about uh, how? Can you talk about some of the austerity uh, measures that have happened in Europe and what the response has been? Yeah, so a lot of those are actually, I mean, it's, it's part of a larger global financial narrative as well, right? So a lot of, they call them the pigs, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain are the ones, and then Iceland you could throw in there as well. That's up in the North Atlantic. It's still these, are the, these are the countries which have been most identified as having um, uh, budget problems where they just yeah. are going broke. So basically, you know, theory. Greece is the one that people talk about the most because they've had near revolutions going on for the the greater part of two years now. And, you know, there are different explanations for why that is. Most of the time they're around, you know, oh, these greedy people, they won't, you know, they think they can retire so early and, and everything. And, oh, they spend so much in the public sector. But a lot of that, um, they got conned into investing a lot of money with Goldman Sachs and oh. then into sort of toxic... Um, bubble that happened and so 
it's tied to the financial narrative, but people are uprising um, significantly and trying to elect officials that will actually stand up to sort of like the EU austerity budget, which just demands that they cut public sector spending or we're never going to loan you money again. So. Yeah, and, and a lot of this comes in the form of IMF loans too. That um, you know, where they. No, I, IMF is. An international Monetary Fund, and um, but you know, and so to kind of like you know, balance these uh, you know government deficits, uh, you know that you know they make out these loans and stuff, but these loans come with the stipulations that they have to make these austerity cuts at the same time too. Or so. devote certain mm -hmm. industries to privatization, and because mm -hmm. that's the natural consequence of all this, and, and sort of this broader narrative is that when you cut public funding of something, that sector doesn't necessarily go away. Like there's still a demand for it, but there's this larger narrative that oh, the private sector does such a, a much more efficient job of this that we'll just dedicate it there. But that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I read in the Oregonian uh, this last Saturday there was an article, a column uh, by Paul Krugman, and he brought up the question about the IMF and what was happening in Europe, and he pointed out that uh, that the countries which have followed the IMF um, strictures have been the ones that have fared worst in this economic crisis, that this worldwide crisis. And so I, I, th I think that's kind of important to, yeah. to, to note, yeah. that the austerity just doesn't work. Yeah, and there are some great um, books that people can follow up on this with as well. Uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman is a great one for the history of sort of these loans in South America and basically the false projections that economists would make to sort of like con leaders of countries into taking these loans and then when they can't repay the loans like oh man you know that's terrible that you can't repay these loans luckily there's like a bunch of natural resources that you can give to first world companies to pay that off and sort of it's this this game at sort of making people sort of and there's a guilt factor attached to debt as well um, that makes people feel like they sort of have to pay it back but it's there's a lot of fraud in this process as it goes uh, Naomi Klein's the shock doctrine is another great investigation of this use of emergency to sort of justify these loans that put mm -hmm. people in these positions. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's a good tie into how um, debt on this level is also tied into to personal debt on um, a level, so with student debts and credit card debts, because as what Mike said, this is sort of a 40 year, 50 year process in the making here, as people's wages have stayed stagnant and if they'd had, they've had uh, less benefits, we've covered that by debt, financial sector debt. So people pay for their medical bills and everything in credit cards. Mm -hmm. um, they pay for student, uh, for school with student loans and sort of, so we've sort of created this other bubble that's going on at the same time. Instead of actually just dealing with these problems, we've created debt mm -hmm. in the process. Right. Yeah, and kind of with your earlier question, like I think this kind of plays into like, you know, why aren't we talking about this in terms of austerity? And, uh, you know, and part of it is because, you know, um, you know, the people of this country hold a lot of private debt, and so like you know, it's a, a combination of you know a student debt or um, uh, uh, you know housing debt, or even just um, you know the anxieties of you know unemployment or tenuous employment or underemployment. Um, you know the idea, uh, the the kind of dialogue that's happening at a national level of like you know uh, taking care of budget deficits in the name of like fiscal responsibility. Uh, makes a lot of sense to people as of how they like privately experience debt. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's something that can mean absolute ruin if you don't, you know, take care of it and stuff. And so, it's it's you know, it's a way to kind of like, you know, magnify that anxiety on a national level to kind of push forward these policies. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and you're know, talking about uh, about um, the fact that our wages and our benefits have been going down uh, and that um, the economic well-being of people has been transferred into debt. Mm -hmm. So much of what happened during the Clinton years when we you know, supposedly had this economic um, boom was that that process was going on. And that if that process hadn't been going on, the so-called boom that was happening during you know, those years wouldn't have happened. Oh, you're saying the argument is that if not for these bubbles that we wouldn't have had this growth? I think that's, yes. uh -huh. well, we measure success in a very narrow standpoint as well, right? Even think about how we measure the success of a corporation. It's a three-month interval. 
sort of is how we do it. And our our sort of historical outlook on successful periods is sort of the same way. So um, from 2001 to 2007, for example, oh my gosh, like I remember watching TV and being like really upset even as a college student and sitting around watching and be like, these people think the market's like never going to crash. Have they never heard about the stock market crash in mm -hmm. like the 20s? And um, it's it's all built on sort of an imaginary game where speculation, and it's it's an, it's hard to understand because it's intentionally complicated, right? But it's pe like multiple people inventing things out of thin air, and they all get really really confident about it. And then at some point, somebody looks in and is like, oh, like when who's going to actually get the returns on this payment? And then when that realization happens, then it's sort of like the scramble to to pick up those debts as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Debt pops and there's no money. Just right. Yeah. So right someone away. someone becomes unconfident that the game can continue and stops playing. Yeah. And, and it's the whole card, oh, the whole deck of cards falls. It's like a casino that you can never lose at if you're one of these banks that's actually like in this game, you mm -hmm. know. And so what's what's the disincentive to actually playing that game? It's uh, they call it. The euphemism for it in financial speak is moral hazard, oh. but it's mm -hmm. it's gambling without risk. That's what right. it is. Okay, yeah, but there is a risk, and unfortunately, risk falls on us. Yeah, right. 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 Well, it's yeah. a very it's there's no risk in a, for a very narrow group of people who have sort of game the system. And right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and so what we've what we've really seen since the beginning of the you know the Great Recession is that the people at the top they really caused the problem. Um, while well, the, well, they just really haven't gotten hit at all. Yeah, and, and in fact, actually, they've um, they're in a better place than they were, like uh, you know, at the bo you know, before just before the mm -hmm. recession. You know, mm -hmm. it's a uh, um, there has been uh, a lot of wealth generated, but it's all just kind of gone straight to the top. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's what at least you know from what I've read about Greece is that. Uh, a, a lot of their problems, uh, they, they simply didn't collect the taxes that were due. Well, Greece has a lot of problems <laughs> in general, <laughs> yeah. uh, and people have been telling me, when I lived in Europe, people told me about people like making plastic olive tree fields to get loans and stuff, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a different animal on its uh -huh. own. Um, not as much, ours, ours is a little bit less relevant, I think, to, to what's going on in Greece. Um, we've got our own sort of animal that we're tackling. Mm -hmm. um, but it's 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 sort of the same. We don't. I don't think in this country we have the same sort of moral problem in having caused it. In fact, I think a lot of this stuff has been sort of created from the top and it's been engineered because of for very very strategic reasons. And um, over time, you can see how it's played out. We've had a lot of crashes of the market actually in the last forty years. It's not been like a steady. Mm -hmm. Incline and every time it happens, like the savings and loan scandals happen, and people actually went to jail for it. You can argue, oh, okay, great, like there actually is some kind of a risk involved, and so people change the laws, mm -hmm. like oh, get rid of that risk, cut yeah. the budget of the the SEC who's supposed to enforce that, make the the legal uh, jurisdiction so complicated that you, nobody ever knows who's supposed to actually enforce these crimes, and they've got no budgets. And then, you know, on top of this, you've got also sort of this this corruption of government where these people that are supposed to enforce these laws are allowed to go actually work for those private groups that are, you know, causing the problems in the first place. Yeah, there's a huge revolving door. Yeah, yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. what's the incentive if you're in the system to actually enforce the rules when all your buddies are moving into private industry and mm -hmm. making, they're making $60,000 a year working for the federal government and next year they're making $250,000 working for a, a law firm on Wall Street. like. Mm -hmm the disincentives for actually being a good guy are right. really heavy. Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you have some uh, suggestions on laws that could be passed that would help rectify this? Sure. I mean, you know, of, of course, you know, the obvious one is, you know, closing tax loopholes on, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the wealthy corporations and, you know, the, um, you know, upping taxes on the rich. Um, uh, you know, as well, too, you know, it's important to kind of, you know, m make this idea of austerity kind of like part of like a public dialogue so that there is actually discussion and energy being put towards figuring out what these best solutions are. So we're not kind of mired into like the frame that we're provided where we're just having to make cuts as the solution and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you know, I, I, so I think we're faced with very obvious um, solutions, uh, such as the tax ones, but also we need to make sure that there is a space to kind of, you know, go beyond that as well. 
which is, I think, what you know, N3 is seeking to do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're really you're really advocating for a mass discussion of the problem, ident mm -hmm. identifying what the problem is, and then discussion about the solutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and you mentioned N3. Talk about N3. Yeah. So um, November 3rd, uh, Portland Action Lab has called for a mass mobilization against austerity. And so the, kind of the, the, the themes that the thematic elements we're running on is um, resist cuts, strike debt, and empower communities. And, um, and so that has a certain logic behind it. Um, resist cuts being kind of what we're facing right now um, with you know, the budget cuts, uh, what's being talked about in elections, um, and striking debt kind of as like this um, midterm kind of goal. There's been a, a kind of started from New York, a movement called Strike Debt. Um, talks about, you know, debt jubilee, um, which is about, you know, particularly like kind of born out of the student movements and uh, student debt is this idea of kind of like divestment from debt that, we, that has been kind of been predatorily put on, uh, you know, by Wall Street and stuff and also is, you know, reflected in our city budgets as well. And, um, and then empowering communities as being kind of like, you know, the long-term goal, like, you know, something that we should be really, you know, pushing for, democratizing kind of like, um, you know, our local budgets, um, you know, how um, communities have a say in which, you know, their local resources are used, or even, um, you know, developing s solutions at a community level that help, you know, people survive like, you know, economic downturns such as this. Okay. So, mm -hmm. You said uh, democratizing the budget. H how, how would you democratize the budget? Yeah, um, there's there's actually a, a project um, developed, been developed in Portland, kind of inspired from um, some projects in uh, I think it was uh, Porto Alegre, Brazil, in, uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, on the idea of uh, participatory budgets. Um, basically, you know, you have a certain portion of the budget that's set aside for maybe like a neighborhood, a community, and the community gets to decide how those funds are used in their community and stuff. So um, there's kind of, you know more of the budget is used to things that will actually help the community instead of going to projects that are going to, you know, redevelop the Pearl District or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. So, so, mm -hmm. so a local community or perhaps in Portland it would be a local neighborhood based, maybe perhaps based on the neighborhood associations that would mm -hmm. call a meeting to discuss this pot of money that they've been given and how it should be spent. Sure. Yeah. And you could think of all sorts of organizational models that could accomplish that same goal. But the problem is why it's necessary is because funds are so unevenly spent and people aren't represented. And so even in a town where, you know, Portland is, we, we do fairly okay on the American scale of democracy, it's still, you wouldn't call it very represented, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So um, some other things that, you know, with empowering communities is just sort of encouraging people to take their own steps as neighborhoods to sort of protect their own as well. So. Um, Today, for example, there's a, another D foreclosure going on, and that's been sort of happening in Northeast Portland quite a bit with people encouraging folks in their community who have sort of been defrauded by the mortgage system to, to not go along with that, to actually stay in your homes and to support one another in that process. So that's, that's another way that communities are sort of taking um, it into their own hands, and we encourage more of that. And we, we hope that N3 brings people together so they can hear these stories of community empowerment, because Portland is a fairly do-it-yourself community, actually, but the people that do it aren't like overly political, right? They just do it because they like their neighbors, and they mm -hmm. do things like go establish a park because they just like people. And so getting those networks established where people understand where these community resources are, where they can go, and they don't necessarily have to beg people who want to put these like austerity measures on them. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Talk, talk, talk more about N3. What, how does the public get involved? Is there a march, rally, and those kind of traditional kinds of things? Or Yeah, there's going to be a uh, march, rally. Um, so how Portland Action Lab works is on a spokes council model where you have a number of organizations who plug in um, and, you know, use this as a, as a kind of like uh, organizing body to coordinate, um, you know, their own actions, you know, for their own uh, groups. So um, this can take, you know, the form of, you know, um, explicit direct actions where they're, you know, making like, you know, direct changes to the community, like providing direct solutions, you know, at the moment right there. 
or um, you know giving visibility you know to their cause or um, or you know to their messaging as well uh, and so it's a way to kind of you know um, give you know, kind of collective support to all our goals, kind of like united around this idea of austerity. Um, also at the same time too, it provides for the public to show that, you know, you have allies in this basically. Mm -hmm. Here are all these people that are, you know, resisting this and are, you know, willing to like develop community solutions to this mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. So, so you hope to tie these issues together so they're not seen as, this is my problem and this is your problem, but, but these are our problems right. and we need to address them. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, we sort of have this national, unique to this country is this sort of like feeling of aloneness and you know, you always hear it with like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is sort of the derogatory way that you refer mm -hmm. to somebody who's having problems. And a lot of these problems are not individual problems. They're, they're programs that start at a very high level and if we were sort of to, to understand the ways in which these connected, we might have a lot more sympathy towards people who are going through these problems. And then when that sympathy is developed, of course you'd want to help out somebody. So it's crucial to these austerity measures being enforced on individuals are these narratives of like, it's your fault and you deserve it and you caused it yourself. And so um, we want to do a lot of things. We want to empower community, we want to change narratives. We want people to actually feel like they can do things on their own. We want people to understand that there's support and we want it to continue beyond the protest as well or the direct action. So okay. it's just it's just a community swelling to show that we're not going away. And then most of the organizing that goes on isn't in the streets, right? It's behind scenes and mm -hmm. people working very, very hard to, to help folks out. Okay, all right, yeah. Where do people go to get more information? Sure, um, so we have two websites. Um, it's portlandactionlab.org um, for more kind of local information if you want to come to our meetings um, and join with the effort there. Um, and then we have a national site for our call out, um, which is a solidarity against austerity uh, dot com. Okay, great. Okay, dot good. org. I think. Dot org. Dot, yeah. dot org. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, well, very good. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you, David. Good. I want to thank our crew for being here today and getting us on the air. Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to the audience for watching. We hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>